Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites, and this is what you're about to hear is a unique uh, episode, a very special episode of Jewish History Soundbites, and I venture to say that there's nothing like this has ever been posted here before. Just a couple hours ago, I got back home from a wonderful trip to Central Europe with Reb Shirley Bornstein and his Dafyemi Chabura, and I was privileged to be together on this trip with my dear friend and colleague and collaborator, Davi Safir, and also got to meet for the first time the legendary Svarim Ch- Chatter uh, podcaster, host of the Svarim Chatter podcast, Nachi Weinstein. First time meeting him in person. And what happened was is that um, last night, uh, the trip uh, last night, it was 1.30 in the morning, and we're sitting around in the hotel, the three of us, and we decided to do something, test something, try something unique um, in recapping the trip, reviewing some of the historical sites we had seen, some of the stories that had been repeated, doing some analysis. And as is the nature of things, we were very overtired, and we were just sitting around together having a casual conversation with the recorder on, Um, So, you know, we also enjoyed some light moments together, um, so bear that in mind as well. And we decided to share that with you um, as diving into both what a trip looks like and also some of the um, history behind the places we went to, the people and personalities we visited, um, and and some of the thoughts and uh, musings that we had about these uh, great historical time periods, places, and figures. Um, bear in mind uh, that this was without any preparation. This was a casual, light conversation at the end of a trip, like I said, also at one thirty in the morning when we were a bit overtired. But I think that this is something that the listeners of Jewish History Soundbites might enjoy, my conversation with Davi Safir, and Nachi Weinstein of the Farm Chatter podcast. And uh, please let me know. Let me know some feedback. And uh, here it is. And I hope you'll enjoy. together with a special episode of Jewish History Soundbites, live from Prague. And I'm here with... Nachi Weinstein with a special edition of the Farm Chatter podcast, live and, from Prague. And we're here with our very good friend and colleague and collaborator... The one and only legend, Davi Safir, and the three of us are here together in a Prague hotel room on a very sp- at the end of a very special trip that we were uh, privileged to be a part of, a Dafyai Museum with Reb Srili Bornstein and the Lakewood Dafyai Mi Chabura, um, which made a museum on Maseches Seit of the Dafyai and started Maseches Gitten, and um, we did this tour the last few days of Central Europe. Um, and we're going to recap a little bit of the tour and try to get into some history discussion here, all three of us together, um, and the, to the benefit of all the listeners of our podcasts. So actually the first day, uh, Davi was able to work out for us a very interesting tour of Vienna. Uh, Davi, can you tell us a little bit about what that tour was like and, and what, we, what we found historically interesting on that walking tour of Vienna? First of all... Thank you for having me on, guys. This is my first time ever appearing on a podcast, and quite frankly, I'm really, really nervous. It's one thirty in the morning, we're sitting in a hotel room in Prague, and I think part of the fact that I'm doing this is because it's one thirty in the morning in a hotel room in Prague, and we had a great time together, and we figured that it would be a fun way to recap it, would be by kind of hanging out together, and hanging out with all of you, and, and talking about this really incredible, memorable uh, three days where we ran around Central Europe with about 75, 80 guys, um, led by Shirley Bornstein, uh, the incomparable Ellie Slomowitz of, of ENS Tours, my friend Sidney Rosen, who was instrumental in putting this whole thing together miraculously. And um, we kind of just did things on the fly, uh, at least the, the touring aspect of it. But uh, the day was really, was really, I said the first half of the day was was pretty serious. It was uh, it was Seder for an hour and a half in the morning, and it really gave a Dafyami Shir and really some of the most iconic locations across Central Europe. Um, we had a 
the first daf Yoyim Yishir was literally yards from the Chassam so Seifer's caver. It wasn't in the caver because that would be a little weird. I like to have daf Yoyim Yishir in the caver, although some people think that bringing guitars and singing inside the caver is also weird. And I'm yet to, you know, totally decide how I feel about that, but I enjoy singing, so it wasn't bad. But um, that was very cool. And, and next day, Yehuda was really, for you, it was really special, I think. Yeah. It was. Um, so the first day, we before we went to the Sam Cipher, we were in Vienna. And um, you... Nachi missed that part, right. So what we did was, um, when we were doing a little research for this trip, like two days before, we realized that uh, it's kind of an auspicious time. And we're approaching a, uh, an anniversary. Um, and a very important anniversary. And considering this... It's possibly, I don't know, I don't know whether it's uh, Rabbi Stefanski or Shirley Bornstein's Chabur, which is the largest Daphne Chabur in the world, I don't know. But um, both of them have tens of thousands of listeners and really have, have listen, changed the landscape of, of Daphne and they literally have these followings that are incredible. And it's, it's literally everything Rabbi Shapiro ever dreamed of. And, and just look at the diversity on this trip, um, Chassidim, Svarim, Ashkenazim, uh, yeah, even Ashkenazim, even Litvaks like me, but um, it's, it's really incredible. And so what we did was, we realized that 1923 is the 100th anniversary of the first Kinsia Gedela when Romer Shapiro announced, dramatically announced, the, uh, the idea, the concept of Daf um, which Yehuda explained, you know, go back and you want to go back and just talk about how that all happened, how that went down, it's a fascinating story. It was. It, it is a fascinating story that that the Romero Shapiro, by the first Knesset of the Israel, which took place in Vienna, he um, has this vision of Dafyaimi. He's somewhat unknown. He's a thirty-six-year-old rabbi in Sanok in Galicia at the time, and the Chafetz Chaim had who was you know excited and wanted to help him with this vision that he had. And he had him walk into the Knesset Gedaila uh, later than um, uh, than everyone else, when everyone else was already seated, and then the Chavetz Chaim stood up for him. Um, and uh, when when the Chavetz Chaim stood up, the everyone else saw the Chavetz Chaim standing up, and he um, and he and he and 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 everyone was it. You know, who is this speaker? And Romeo Shapiro was quite a dynamic speaker, a very charismatic speaker. So it, it, everyone was ready for whatever he had to say. And Romeo Shapiro spoke about his vision for Yeshiva Schach Lublin. And he also mentioned the idea that we would bring the Jewish people together through their eternal treasure, which is the Torah itself, by everyone learning a daf a day, the same daf, and everyone all over would be united in this study of Torah by learning the daf Yaimi, which was a somewhat revolutionary concept. He even very poetically said it, which we spoke about there, that um, he saw it on the daf of the Gemara itself, that the Mishnah was written in, in the Eretz Yisrael, and the Gemara was authored in Bavel, and Rashi was in France, and the Taisus were in Germany, for the most part, and the Marsha in the back uh, of the Gemara was in Ostroy, which is today in Ukraine, and the Marshal was in Lublin, and each one with their contribution came from a different part of the Jewish world, and they're all united on the Daf Gemara. So how would it be if everyone would be on the Daf Gemara learning that every day? But what Davi did for us is that for the first time, we've been to Vienna many times on tours, but he mapped out a route going to the buildings where the Knesset Gedaila was, where the Chafetz Chaim in that famous video walked down. We were standing in that alleyway and dancing in that alleyway, and pointing out the uh, original building is not there, but it's uh, the same address of where the Knesset Gedel took place, which was an amazing moment to be uh, standing there in the middle of the Vienna street and saying, this is where history happened, this is where Dafyaimi started. By the way, it's, it's, it's much more comfortable seeing you dancing in cemeteries, as weird as it is, as it is, and seeing you dancing with yarmulkes in the streets of Vienna, because those looks that we got, you know, it's definitely never happened over there in much of that location, which, you know, which leads me to believe no one's, no one's checked out. I know that the, 
the theater where the 29, where the second Casino was held, it's kind of it was it was bombed during the war, but I think it was restored. I think Dershu once held an event there. But this is just an office building, but the alleyway. And if you look, uh, and if you look at the pictures, I think Shmuel Chavetz Chaim walking, right? You see that alley, and we sang and we danced and we spoke about it. We spoke about how how this casino, this place with the casino that was held was actually a circus. It was a it was circus rings. It was a place where they put on high end. Circus performances. They went from the old gypsy model of circuses to try and there's a German company that tried to really turn the um, turn circus into a theatrical performance with equestrian and gymnastics, all kinds of uh, acrobatics, and uh, it became a you know became something that was sought out you know by royalty and by, by the high class folk. And in fact, um, I think that that. Um, I think it was Franz Yusuf who had one of his quote unquote Sheva Bruchas over there at the um, at the circus. I think uh, one of the nights after we got married, there was a celebration and it was held here. So it, it was quite a it was quite an opulent place. But I would say that by 1923 it was somewhat run down because it had been built almost 75 maybe 75 years earlier. But I think the, the question that I had going into this um, and and I think some other people did was if the Agudas Israel was formed in 1912 in Katowice, what takes so long for them to host the Kansir de Bell 11 years later, right? So I think that people who read, um, we went through an article about the Rav Nazir, uh, we talked about this a little bit. And what does the Rav Nazir have to do with the Kansir de Bell? And, and his Rebbe, Rav Cook, has everything to do with it. Is that Rav Cook comes. In summer of 1914, for what is supposed to be the first Kasidic dialogue, which was to be held in Frankfurt or Berlin, I think Frankfurt, um, but I don't recall at the moment which city it was. He arrives in Germany, um, and not long after he arrives, World War One breaks out, and this Kasidic, which is supposed to be held in L of 1914 never held. And obviously, if Cook ends up in St. Gallen in Switzerland, and ultimately in London through World War One, then he gets back to to um, Israel. But obviously, we're going off topic, you know, because I like to go off topic. Um, can we talk about Jenny Miller, by the way? Because that's what I thought we were going to do. I, I, think, oh. I, I think with WCB, we have to talk about Jenny Miller, right? How, how, how is he going to do something and but not talk about Jenny The problem Miller. with Nachi Weinstein, because, you know, I really know only things that happened, I would say, I don't know, after Volodian opened... 1802 until Byron Cutler died. So it's like a 160 year period. Nachi knows everything that happened, like the 2,000 years preceding. So we're going to have to kind of find a, a middle ground. So we'll, we'll, we'll find some, some stuff that, that, that are interesting. We actually discovered that the super talented Nachi, um, besides for everything he did know here, he pointed out to us two drawbacks of our trip that none of the places we, were, we visited were in Italy. So that kind of limited him. Um, and he also said that people like the Chassam Seifer lived after the 1700s, 1800s, and therefore, you know, not really an interesting time period in history. So, Nachi, what did you feel about the historical places we saw on this but trip? Prior to this trip, had you ever heard of any of these people? Like Chavaz <laughs> Chaim and Chassam Seifer? Guys, guys, I learned Chavaz Chaim. Um, oh, wait, wait, forget it. We, I also discovered in this trip, I'm, I'm just going to go, well, we're just going to say it. Nachi is a pretty Jewish guy. Like, I never realized this, but, but Nachi is for a guy who's like a strictly academic and he's in law school and, and uh, you know, he hosts some, some pretty high-end talent on his, on his podcast. Yuda doesn't host anyone but himself because he's high-end talent. But... Um, Pretty shit was your guy. Hat jackets, it's a sad. I was very impressed. Very, very impressed. impressed. Whilst me and Yehuda, we were, I don't think we were ever really hat and jacket all the time. It's just out guys. But, you know, we're, we're still Yeshiva guys at heart, right? You know, Yehuda came to this trip. I don't think he brought a button down shirt. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's just, you know, listen, it's just Yehuda. I, I missed Vienna, as they said, so I don't have much to add on Vienna. Unfortunately, I wish I would have seen it, but. The interesting thing is, you know, W mentioned walking through Vienna was uncomfortable. We just walked through Prague past midnight. You know, I walked through in a hat and jacket and tits out and white shirt, and it was very comfortable, no issues. A beautiful city, by the way. But anyways, what you were saying, so I do know some later history. I did learn in Yeshiva's Baruch Hashem. I learned Chavaz Chaim. I learned many of these Sfarim. 
you know, familiar we with Tom Sutherford. We learned from Philadelphia, you see, right? Yes. Jenny Miller. Jenny Miller, there you go. Yeah. Jenny Miller. You but did, I, have you ever heard of Jenny Miller? Mishpacha article. Really? You know, what about the chair? Did you know about the chair in Shmuel's house? I actually didn't know about the chair. I mean, I've been in Shmuel's house. Obviously, we would go on Yom Tov. Like, for sure, as I met as I recall, he would speak in his house. Okay, but we made up. We're not talking about Jenny. But anyways, anyways, but going back to that, of course, like Yehuda said, is true. But I do know some amount of history. I mean, I've done some things on the podcast. I know less than the two experts with me in this room in Prague. But uh, I do know something about it. But I think what was so beautiful about this trip, and again, like Yehuda said, I'll, I'll also recognize, you know, El Islam was in ENS Torres, Shirley Bornstein and the Hevra over here. It was really a terrific trip, uh, very enlightening. It was, it was really Tairu Gdullah by Maka Mechad. We had just great Gashmis, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit, but also the Ruchni is Seder every day, Dafyei Mishir, and these places, these real places with major historical importance for the Jewish people. But also, it was, it was, it was just a, a, a really interesting trip to see these places where, as we said, we went to the Chsam Soif, we went to Bratislava, Pressburg, was Pressburg, and we get to see the, the Chsam Soif and the Chsam Soif in later history, but we also went to Nicholsburg, where we had some earlier history, we went, where there was the Reverend Shmolka, but I was able to, you know, the Tzemach Tzedek HaKadman, and Renachem Edel Krochmel was there, an earlier uh, Mechaber, and... Was there just two Tzemach Tzedeks? <laughs> it's like this, 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 for some reason it becomes instead of the Tzemach Tzedek HaAcheren it becomes the Tzemach Tzedek HaKadman even though major place like, another Who one was he? Menachem Mendel Krochmal tell us that. tell me about him because I don't really know anything he was um, it's going off and he was a, a major place like, at the time um, I believe I would want to say I'm, I'm going to try to recall who I, I think he learned by the Bach I'm trying to remember who he's a uh, Talmud of I think. But I wanted to just finish. The, the other one, you have the same type of thing, is with Rebbe Virgas. Just, I have to tie in Italy Ooh. over here. I have to bring in Italy. Bring in Italy. Rebbe Yosef Virgas, the Shemer Emunim, one of the preeminent Mukubalim who explains the Kabbalistic, you know, basics. He's a basic introduction to Kabbalah, was the Rav in Levarno. Came from a very prominent, wealthy family in Levarno, and he lived in Levarno in the 18th century. And Rebbe Yosef Virgas wrote a famous statement called Shemer Emunim. It is a classic work until today. Somehow, he was Zeichah with Shemer Emunim HaKadrin because of the Shemer Emunim. Now, you guys are the Hasidish, you guys here. For some reason, the Hasidim displays these famous, world-famous Gedalim. And not to detract from the Hasidim, by the way. I mean, these, we're talking about major rabbis, but it's just an interesting thing. It, it takes away. It becomes, if you see any Sefer today, Shemer Emunim HaKadrin and it's Tzemach Tzedek HaKadrin. That's what they're called, even though they were major... Uh, sorry. Anyways, I just want to finish this thought with... Um, I want to finish this thought by saying that... Um, it really was, we were able to see both new and old history. You know, coming to being in Holoshev, we saw the Shach, which is older, and we'll get to this, and then being in Prague, you really have history until, you know, from Victor Kara and from the Morale, and then we got up until Shir, who, you know, just for Dubby's Prague history. really excited you, Nachi. I saw that today. Uh, tell us what excited you in Prague. Prague really excited me, I think, a lot of things. Being in, uh, also, I'll just say this is my first time really in Europe. You know, I'm sitting next to two veterans of Europe. This is like my first time. This is really um, no, fascinating. No, neither of us are veterans. We didn't fight in any army. I just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> Veteran travelers. Okay. But um, it really was amazing. I, I think things that stuck out to me, being in the old cemetery in Prague, right, you know, going into Alt Neuschul, of course, but the old cemetery where it's like you have the buildings all over bearing around you with the trees hanging over and all those graves sunken in, being all around, walking in, the first kera that just hits you in the face, so to speak, is David Gans, the Tzemach David, the, the major historian, um, one of the, you know, Talmud of the Maral, he knew Brahe and Kepler and he was, he was, you know, the astronomers, I mean, he was a real fascinating individual and, and the others and then also going to the newer cemetery, of course, seeing the Neid of Yehuda and others, but for me, um, one of the Fleckless, Talmud of the Neid of Yehuda, I've learned his Sfarim, gone through his Sfarim, Maitzvah Rabbi Lazar and Haggadah Shepesach, amazing. Um, his Oilash Chaydesh, Harish, Nasheni, Ashlishi, his, his Drush is there. Amazing things that I've gone through and learned. And to be next to his Kever and to, you know, you don't, you're not in the same presence as him, he's not alive, but you feel that and you're able to kind of see that one of the And he was later history, guys, he was in the 19th century. Uh, I'm Bezin of Prague, so this is just something amazing. But I'll let you go back. I, I, we'll go back. I want to point something out. I come from the world of my background, is a little bit in the world of finance. And 
in the world of finance, we like to make fun. Is that nobody talks about a hedge fund manager? They say he's a big hedge fund manager. So I find by the like the Shalos and Chubas guys, you know, the guys that are into halacha, all that everyone's a big pasuk, right? So are they like small paiskim or everyone's just a the big small paiskim? Everyone forgot about, and it's really the big ones that stood the test of time. I mean, just the night of Yehuda had hundreds of Talmidim. There's a reason people rem- remember Belazar Fleckless and not some of the others. Because also, I think we said that Fleckless is like a top ten name. No? Top ten last name. Fleckles what does or it Fleckless? Mean? I don't know. Not I would suspect, mean. and I haven't done last names yet on this podcast, I would suspect that maybe his grandfather worked in the local shlachta is flicking uh, feathers off of chickens. That was his job, so it was Fleckless. But it could be that there's 12 other explanations for what that name means. Yeah, I don't know either. I know he's a descendant of, I think his name was a mayor or Moshe Mayor Perilous, who was a guy and he was in Prague. So he wrote a safer, Megillah Safer. We have it on Megillah Esther. I know he's, Lezzo Fleckler says he's a descendant of his. Isn't Megillah Safer of Yaakov Emden? That's his autobiography. autobiography. It's one of, one of, uh, talking of Prague, a safer on Mr. Mm-hmm. McGill. Who just like talks sports or something? Up and I'm, no, no, we'll state this. But I, I want to get to one more thing. You mentioned famous. I mean, I want to jump back to the, to the well, I want to go back really to pick it up and, and we'll go in the, in the trip with Bratislava. But just, you met, you asked about the Samach Tzedek and his Rebbe was the Bach. Um, his years were 1600, 1661. His Talmud was Gershon Ashkenazi, the Vedas Gershuni, another very famous place. Like, but really, the Samach Tzedek is famous for, he has, he has involved in a lot of Takhanis, he was involved with, with the fish, breaking the monopoly on the fish, the guy were ripping off the Jews, and there's some other things going on. He is, he's quoted, what he means by a famous Paisic, I think, especially with the, with the Shalos of Shuvis, is like Yehuda said, they last the test of time, they've been quoted again and again and again. I mean, there's many, many major Rabbana we don't know about, they didn't have Ksav, they didn't have writings, or whatever the case is, but he's someone that's quoted, he's a very big um, Paisic, and I mean, you know, I'll, I'll just leave it like that. So I don't know if you guys want to get back to, to Bratislava. You guys can really talk about the But it, it is good because you, you're like, you are certainly Bornstein for sure, but you're like one of the arbiters as to the people who get to decide who is a big Pisces. You got to admit it, it's a good feeling. I, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't think I get to decide. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm a Barachi on this. You think I, what, what do you mean by that? I guess when Achi Weinstein says this, like this safer is a major safer, is a big price. Like, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that's true. I'm not uh, qualified. Mostly the Svarim are not learning yeshivas, right? And that's where people know about, for the most part, they learn about, so if you're not like a bibliophile, right? And you don't know about these Svarim, so, you rely on a guy like you or like Ruzrelli who brings down all these Svarim all the time. Right? I think find that's, out. I think that's to, yeah, 100% to, right, though. Yeah. To, to find out, I mean, just... Not like, specifically Nachi, listen, but people like him. Nachi, there are perks to every job. In Mishbacha, we get to create Gedalim. So it's, it's just a different... It's, 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 it's a different thing. But but it's... It, you got to admit it. It's, it feels, it feels no, good. I, I will say there's some truth because he is quoted in Halacha. But again, most people go to Nicholsburg as he went, right? You go there and you see the farm. You see Ramot Chabanet has this massive, massive kever. And next to Ramot Chabanet, Rabbi Shmelka has like a small kever with some gold on it. And then next to him is smaller is the Tzemach Tzedek. So he's there, but I assume that most people and most tour guides, not our expert tour guide, you the Geber here, <laughs> probably kind of, I, again, I assume, I, listeners can correct us, they don't know the Tzemach Tzedek, who he was, or Nachman Krochmel, what's going on over here? Maybe they think it's Nachman Krochmel, I don't know, they're, they're, they're confused with what's going on. <laughs> But, uh, right, so in some ways, yes, there's yeah. truth. Well, we do know, and, and, and this has been pointed out many times, and especially in America when you go to the same, there's, there is zero correlation, and maybe, maybe it's the opposite, between Matzeva size and greatness. And in fact, there are the people that build mausoleums for themselves, and even Rebbe's sometimes, the Chassidim build mausoleums for them to prove how great they are, right? But it really means nothing. And you go to the old Jewish cemeteries in New York, and you see mausoleums built for people, and you see they've been locked for who knows how many years, and most likely they have no Jewish descendants even, many of them. I'm, I'm trying to think of, of Yudayel and Yisrael, obviously the, the major ones, sometimes it gets built later because it becomes a schiz yugulaini and people start coming to their caver en masse, or like obviously like the Zamarov, people like that, where they already know that it's going to be a major, major site. People are going to come back from Tvila, Right, the Baba Rebbe, people get, they have, you know, they have, even like, you know, the little awning they have in Har, in Har Menuchas, right, where Aaron or Moshe, right, right? and where our rebels are buried, they have like an awning there for the heat, right, and, and I think the two people I could think of that have like, uh, quote unquote, uh, mausoleums in, 
in Israel, right, are Ramir Shapiro. Har Menuchas. And Har Menuchas, right, are Har... Har Shapiro and the Chida. Harry Fischel. But I, I want to just Indian, you know, he's, he's an Indian to quote. Harry Fisher, really, by the way, needs uh, Jewish history. So I, definitely. I, I just want to jump in before I get back to you. I want to Indian, Indian, but he's an Indian. I said to quote Rabbi really here. But you see, it's not Yeshiva. It, it, yeah, it, it, it sounded Yeshiva. Has anyone ever said that on your podcast? No, I you, never said that. Do you use that on Swarm Chat or Stam when you have guests? Usually not. Usually not. Well, Indian, but Indian, but it's, I'm, 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 I was really born seen on this trip. This is what's really <laughs> used is in the raid bites. But I want to point out something that goes very, you know, with what you're saying, Davi, is that there was one thing that really shocked me on the trip. It, it shocked me. It did. We walked into the basic forest, the small old one in Bratislava, in Pressburg, and everyone went to the Chassam Seifer, rightfully so. Ramayisha Seifer, the Chassam Seifer. I mean, we're sitting there, you know. Ramayisha Chobne Goyla. But, Right when you walk in there, it's like underground for those that have been there. I was the first time I was there. And you walk in and the first kever on the right is a broken kever. And there's like propped up this yeshivish white plastic sign. Who is it? It's from Meshulam who dies in 1801. He's before the Chassam Seifer. Meshulam Igro is the Rebbe of the Ktsois, the Nesivas. In yeshiva, I grew up in Mesifta. I heard Meshulam Igro going out here. Like... And his kever is can't even... No, so my friend writes me, I put it on my status, he says, they can't fix Rosholom Igra's kever? So I wrote back to him, they can't fix Rosholom Igra's svarim? For those listening to the podcast, explain to me why Rosholom Igra's svarim, I'm not sure it's in print, even if it's in print, is this old, disgusting pr- letter is from back then. Why hasn't it been redone? Ladies and well, gentlemen, it sounds like an appeal. <laughs> if you do want to put out Rosholom Igra's svarim, Nachi Weinstein is interested in getting involved. And I'll be the first person to contribute. How's that? There you All go. Right. But 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 so we should put together. Pro- I'll, I'll I'll you know if anyone else email me svarimchatter at gmail oh, cool, cool. We talk about Ayla Kluch? But but one more thing. <laughs> but one more thing before that. But what shocked me was is that Ramashul Migra was known as a going. I mean, he really was. And somehow, of course, the Chassam Soifer is, is is amazing. He just gets dwarfed. But we had almost a hundred people in there, and every, almost every single person just walked right by him and had no clue that he was there. He was a few feet down and no idea. So that's what you're saying, like. Who makes or breaks the it's, it's interesting. I want to, to, want to me. say two points about that as the, the, the tour guide who brings the people to these places. And in Menachis, right, it happens every time. The point is, is that when you're going, Nachi mentioned two things the Sfarim, which I'm less involved in, that's his expertise. I, I'm more of a cemetery person than a Sfarim person. And uh, you're going to a place where more than one person is buried. The rule of trips is that you're going to focus on that one person, and it's natural. It makes sense. I could give you endless. Ex- you brought up an example just a few minutes ago. People are going to Nicholsburg. They're going to be going either to the Maram Banet or the Rebbe Shmelka. More likely, the Rebbe Shmelka, and the Tzemach Tzedek or Nachum El Krochmo is going to get overlooked. Um, I get. I have an even better example. How do you like this? In the Isle of the Baal Shem Tov in Mezhibij, the Ayav Yisrael, the Abderav, is buried next to him. I don't think on any tour we've devoted enough equal time to the Abderav. Maybe when we spent our time in his shul later on, in the, in, in, you know, we go down uh, to his shul, like for Shaloshudas or something, for there for Shabbos. But if you're by the kever, you're davening by the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. You're not really spending time yeah, with that's the Abderav. That's not fair. That's not fair. I mean, you're always going to get distracted. You know, when you have someone like the Baal Shem Tov, it's not so fair. It's true, but it's it's similar to getting distracted by the Chassam Seifer and ignoring, so to speak, uh, Rabbi Shalom Igra. But could, could we discuss the Ichbin and Einikul phenomenon? And Srili, Rabbi Srili said something to me which, which really resonated. And he says that, especially you go on these trips, right, and you go to the Chassam Seifer and like half the people are Einikluch, right? Now to be who half the people are, are Einikluch. Right, uh, uh, the Maral people are Enikluch, right? Then we have the Enikluch of the Goylem. But, but, but uh, honestly, honestly, being an Enikul is not just something to brag about. It's a responsibility. He says, if you're, if you're an Enikul of whoever, whomever, who, who, you know, there are Svarim that, that are sitting here that have, that desperately need to be published or republished in their manuscript form, or they haven't been republished in, in decades, right? And they're badly in need, right, of being fixed up. And some of them in the first place were never done properly, right? I'm not saying we're in a position to do it, but, but you know, if you're an anical, you know, and you want to really, you know, 
do your job. You know, stop walking around and saying, Ich bin ein Einikel, right? We had this idea, right, by making those caps that say, Ich bin ein Einikel, and giving out different pins, like depending on who you're an Einikel of, and people could have like six pins, like Chassam Seifer and Moral. But seriously, if you're an Einikel, and, and, and you're an Einikel of someone who, who's really put out some, you know, major works, written stuff, and, and you've never, and, and it's never been published, no, do your job. Uh, reach out to Nachi, and he could probably put you in touch with the right people who could do it. But this is this is not an appeal; it's a plea. And and if you want schusim, right, you go daven there, put out their Torah, and 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 you'll see. You know, I could, I could, you know, I'm not the kind of person that says, uh, you know, he's going to promise you this because he promised you that. But I think it's a, it's a pretty good one. It, it, I, I won't, I'm not either. I'm not a segula person. But what I could tell you is, so if of David is bekever, you want you want. For example, we're standing in Prague. The morale is here. The morale is a living person. The morale has Tzvarim. The morale died in the early 1600s. The morale talks to us today. You open up a Gvor Hashem. You open up a Nezach Yisrael. You open up morale. You realize he's talking. He's talking to us still today. And Machon Yishlaim, Rabbi Hartman, just published a new edition of his Drush Allah Torah for Shavuos. Brand new. You can read about what the morale gave a sermon in Prague. Probably in the Alt Noy Shul. You can read it now. He's here. But for some reason, I, I mentioned the Rashul Migur, this is an example of others. People say, like, like Davi's saying, I've been an Enikel. So go reprint the Svarim. They're talking, they're there. They're going to defend you. You're going to come up to Ganadin. These Svarim are going to come and defend you. It, it blows my mind. There's Svarim not in print, not redone, not available. Forget manuscripts, which is even more money and more work. But the Svarim that are available, you can just redo. This is them. It, it's, it's amazing to go to the Kever and to Davin. But I would think, and I'm not. Qualify, so don't. I mean, I'm sure there's others say to go to the farm, but you're literally printing their words, you're printing their Torah. It's a schus for their neshama, for them, that you're learning their Torah, you're making it available for them. And it's just amazing that people walk around. And listen, Rips really, as far as I know, is not an anecdote of Chassam Seifer. He just, you know, sponsored a brand new edition of Pituche Chaisam, the Chassam Seifer's Hakdama to your day that is son of Shimon Seifer, Krakow, put together, Chassam Seifer's like Machshava and things. And, and I put it together with notes, a beautiful, brand new edition. So Maybe we need like a crowdfunding site where people could launch campaigns to put out Sparm. That would be cool. It's a good idea. Maybe, maybe we have a listener out here among the probably tens of thousands that are going to listen to this podcast um, that wants to put together a, a platform to, to crowdsource um, Sparm. That would be pretty cool, huh? So I, I want to, it is, and I want to, I want to think of too much Svarim chatter, but to go back to Jewish history sound bites here. We're trying to keep things even. No, no, it's even, but I want, I want to, I think we should go in the direction of Jehovah. I mean, going back to what I was saying about Bratislava, you have probably been there. I want to ask you who the question, so my wife became the moderator here for a second. You've been there many times. My first time there. I said, I, this, this thing that shocked me. But of course, other than that, what is, I don't know, what stuck out to you from this trip, going to Bratislava, being with Chassam Soifer, Chassam Soifer, what stuck out to you from the trip? By the Ksav Soifer, what I liked was the, that um, I was, I was, uh, um, uh, Ksav Soifer's in the new cemetery higher up above the hill um, from where the Ksav Soifer is buried, and that's the new cemetery, which is pretty much intact, more or less. Um, and there were several people who told me before the trip, my, instead of Ich bin ein this was a better one, my Zayda was the Reish Akuhul in Preshburg, Bratislava, before the war, and since he was the Reish Akul and had a lot of money, he's buried next to the Ksav Seifer. And it kind of like brushed it aside, because what are the odds that, you know, so many people's grandfather was the Reish Akul? What surprised me was that I found every single one of these Kvarim, and I took pictures for them. There are, some of them are my neighbors in Beit Shemesh, and uh, it was amazing. So that's what surprised me, and it started to get me thinking again about how large and prestigious and historic this community was, that there were quite a few Rashi Hakol over the centuries, and they're all really buried next to the Ksav Seifer, and some of them have some prominent, large, um, somewhat ostentatious Matzevas, gravestones, uh, that I noticed, and that was interesting to see. We also found some children and grandchildren of the Ksav Seifer, his youngest daughter, Simcha, um, who passed away in the early 1900s. It was amazing that 75 years after the Ksav Seifer's passing, his daughter was still alive, so she's buried right near her brother, the Ksav Seifer, and, and the Ksav Seifer's Rebetzin. Um, so we had, we had uh, some of the Rebetzins too, which is always nice also, especially since 
Davi reminded us with the Jenny Miller article to never forget about the women as, as well. The next day we went to Holoshev, to the Shach, um, and... Uh, wh- what? Oh, we did after Nickelsburg. Yeah, I'm trying to think yeah, of Yeah, we went to Nickelsburg, and then we went to Holoshev and the Shach. By the way, Nickelsburg? Beautiful town. Underrated. Beautiful yeah. town. Beautiful town to walk around. You feel like you're somewhere in the Mediterranean. It's really a nice town. Yeah, in it, fact, Davi and I, the Seder was, we have to admit, the Seder was going a little too long for our taste. Nachi was learning very stark. But Davi and I took a little break, went to a coffee shop in Nicholsburg, where allegedly Reb Reb Shmelka would go have his coffee. Um, so that was also pretty historic as well. I, I just want to jump in for a second, that it was a really pretty town. And if anyone wants videos of the mayor, you can ask Davi. <laughs> so... <laughs> By the way, yeah, if anyone does know, we met the, the there's a, 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 a Yid who lives out there who really gave us a tour, a little bit of a tour, a fascinating person, really a fascinating person who seems to have devoted his life to taking care of the town of Nicholsburg. Um, and, uh, you know, shout out to him because he's, he's, doing, he's doing great work out there, preserving uh, basic forests. Um, he, some, it seems like he added that, like gold lace to Schmelke's caver, which... Definitely, his Matseva, which is definitely deserving. Um, and also, obviously, we had the great Dovi Meisels singer with us on the trip, and we got to sing Every Year is a Big Tzaddik in Nicholsburg, right? Which is really, it's a, it's a, I think it's a niggin of the Nichols, the current Nicholsburger ever. So that was a, a Nicholsburger niggin that, that we knew. But uh, since, uh, you know, there's one HD guy sitting with two very academic guys, I'm just going to go back to Chassam Zyber again. But I have to say one thing. If you've never been to Chassam Seifer's Kaber, I can't even try and describe to you what it's like. And you, you can let, you should probably, if he hasn't done an episode on it, you probably should. The whole story about how it came to be. But Chassam Seifer is buried literally in a tunnel, which is burrowed underground, underneath the train. The train. No, it's, a, it's a miracle, and, and people have tremendous chassam for saving saving that small part of the of the base at Kvaras. But but it's just something about it. Going down there, it's dark, it's in this cave. It's just it's one of those it Surreal. Um, it's it's surreal. It's absolutely it's dark and you get that feeling in there, you walk in there single file and, and it's Khsam Cypher. It was, you know, Khsam Cypher and it's it's incredible. It really have that feeling and it really lends itself to Tvila. Like almost like no other cave I've ever been to, and then you know I'm not a Hungarian or a Central European. You know I, I, you know, I sometimes like to say that on one side my family comes from Lita, and the other we come from Lizhensk, right? So I love to hear Chassidish Shemaisas. I just don't ever believe them, but but really I have no connections with Sam Soifer in that world, um, other than some of the Torah I've heard from Sruli and obviously others because. Everyone knows some of the Chassam Zeifer's Torah, but but it it really is a surreal place. So on your next trip to Shaila, it's not that far from there. It's Kedai to go, and no one ever regrets going to Chassam Zeifer's Kaver. I, I want to add one more thing before you Uda talks about Holoshev. Is that something that really struck me today in Prague? I, I'm not a Mufis guy, as Uda likes to say, but there's some some. Type of just hashkacha pratis when when you're when we saw this in in, in Bratislava with the Chassam Soifer in this cave as Dovi described and you have Amshol Migra and of the Nil Prostitutes you have others in there and then we were in Prague and we go to the new cemetery today and this part was rescued in Bratislava there's nothing left of the old cemetery there's this little cave and then we went to in Prague we go to the newer cemetery where the Nedim is and most of it is like gone it's a parking lot and there's a big building and a huge TV antenna I don't know what's going on over there and you get to the back where the Rabbanim are again Nadi Behuda Rabbi Lezaflekas and we'll talk more about it that also was saved and that really was saved the communists it's just there's a certain hashkacha that the big major Rabbanim were they were saved despite everything else being destroyed of the cemetery well yes and no I think in Vilna there's still a battle right to, to try oh, and yeah. they're always I'm just there was a certain Ashkoche here that, that stuck out to me. That's all. But the trip that we went to these two places with these two basic cars, they, they just stuck out to me. That's right. I want to just describe the moment that Nachi had when he, he was able to go to the cave of Shir. Um, yeah, that was a very... The port, the son of, who I discovered, I had no idea, was the son of the Ketzais, which is pretty major. Um, and, and Nachi loves to talk about Shir, as does Yehuda. And I had no idea who Shir was. I always thought Shir was a girls' camp somewhere in the Catskills. Um, I had no... I'm, being totally honest, I didn't know about Shir. But now I got to learn a little bit about him. But if you saw Nachi's face, 
um, when he when he saw the Matzeva and he started reading it. And then I got to walk with Nachi through the weeds, the tall weeds of the cemetery, and he like he knows these names of people like random people buried in the cemetery, like neighbors of Shir and cousins of Shir. And he was just describing, telling me this person lived here and that person lived here and that person was a doctor. This guy was a Rosh Hakul. And it was pretty cool because he, he really he really knows his stuff when it comes to, to that era and, and these and, and these people. Um, but uh, obviously going to the Buddhist cave was, was also, uh, you know, a highlight. The, 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 it was. Uh, and... and uh, um, Nachi did 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 like going to Shir's cover. We also found um, Baruch Yetlis's, uh, uh gravestone. It was incredible. Nachi says it was his first time in Europe and going this. He was almost like a tour guide. So I think we're going to make a push for Nachi to drop the law career. There's enough Jewish lawyers out there, and we need more good quality tour guides. So if you think Nachi would make an excellent tour guide. And you can share with us your thoughts as well about that. Um, the reason Nachi is fascinated, and I am fascinated, with people like Shlomo Yehuda Rappaport, the Shir, uh, or Rabarch Yetlis, um, were because these moderate maskilim were also rabbis. They were what we would call religious rabbis, Shemri Tairu Mitzvahs, um, big Torah scholars as well at the same time. They're like these in-between figures because they're at the same time they welcomed and promoted the ideas and ideals of the Haskalah, of the Jewish Enlightenment. And therefore they're nuanced figures and they're exciting because our world does not like nuance. We like black and white. So when we find someone who's confusing to us, oh, he's a Moscow, but he's also a rabbi. He's a Moscow, like Baruch Yetlis, but he also respected the Night of Yehuda, and he also wrote a... What was the safer that he wrote, Nachi? Tama Melech. On Shara Melech of uh, Rabbi Yitzchok, Nunez, not Nunish, Mechon Yishalayim, Belmonte. Major safer on Rambam. And, and here he's writing a commentary on, this, uh, on the safer. He's a rabbi in Prague, and he's also a Moscow. So they're confusing figures, and confusing people makes us excited. Maybe because we're confused, I don't know. It's something to discuss with your local therapist or whatever, and 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 to to see that and discuss that uh, can make it an interesting part of the trip. Obviously, not to take away from the main things like the night of Yehuda, or as we saw the day before in Holoshev, going to the Shach. The Shach is one of those farm that doesn't need reprinting. It's printed in every Shulchan Aruch, and it's such a classic sefer. And I pointed out to the group how he had finished it by the time he was twenty four years old. And I don't want to share with the listeners how unaccomplished I was by the time I was 24 years old, relative to what the Shach accomplished by the time he was that age. And you're in his shul. Um, it's not his shul. It's a 500-year-old shul, and many people dive into that shul. But the Shach was probably the most famous rabbi of that town. And again, we heard a very uh, nice shear from Reb Shirley Bornstein in a, in a place where the Shach may have g- gave regularly, we, not may have, he regularly delivered shiurim. And it's like uh, things come around again. The Taira is still being shared. And it was also a very historic moment um, to be there in Holoshev by the Shach. I appreciated really what Reb Shirley pointed out about the Shach, that he lived through the darkest of times, right? Gzer Stach Batat. And. Um, and he still remained this extremely positive person, and and if you look at if you look at his writings, you don't you don't realize that this is somebody that that literally went through hell, um, went through one of the worst periods in, in Jewish history, and and we tend to forget, you know, all these years later exactly what it was, but it certainly was, you know, you, you go. Mount Rushmore of, of, of awful periods in the last five hundred years, or so five six hundred years. It's definitely tach for tach. It's got it's got to be up there. I'm not. It's not worth two fifteen in the morning in Prague. We're not going to do like a hall of fame of, of Jewish, you know, tragedies. Tragedies, you know. But but it really is something that it, it's definitely worth exploring again. I think Yehuda has a podcast on it as well. One of the early ones. Um, and you do too. Nachi has one also. With Professor Adam Teller, the post tech for that, I think he told me, it's an excellent book, Rescue the Surviving Souls, and he talks about, I think, like a third of the jury was killed out. I mean, it was only like, only 
fifty thousand people compared to like the Holocaust. But like, I think that was not like I could be wrong. But it's, it's an amazing the Jewish number. People living in those areas, in Poland, you know, the, the Polish kingdom of Poland, just like Ukraine and Poland, and 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 the Shach wrote a history of this, Megillus Eifa, um, and then there was actually printed Tzvi Rosen, who's a Ben Acher Ben, printed now uh, the Slichas that for the first time since the, the Shach wrote Slichas, which we were like to say by the cover there. Right. It was a new reprinting. There was something else time. fascinating about the Shach Shul, um, which is, you look at the Aaron Kodesh, and the Parechas is dedicated in memory of uh, the Teitelbaum, in memory of the Satmarov. And that to me was, was pretty, I don't know, I'm, I'm never really surprised, but this shocked me. And you had a pretty good story to kind of uh, explain yeah. right? the Satmar Shach, not Rav Shach, but Shach connection. It was funny. The first time I went to the Shach Shul, I noticed that someone had donated, it's recent donation, not pre-war, obviously. Um, and this, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, Shach, in the Shach Shul, there's this recent, this recent um, uh, Parechis donation in memory of the Satmarav. So you got to find the connection. And luckily there is one. And the story I told was that there was this fellow who came to the Satmarav and asked him why the Shulchan Aruch doesn't mention in Hilchus Ribis that someone who loans money with interest, he's not going to have Tchias HaMesim. The Gemara apparently says that if you do Ribis, you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to have Tchias HaMesim. So why does the Shulchan Aruch say that? Mention it, should mention that you're not going to be, be resurrected when when the when Mashiach comes from the dead, if you do ribis, so the Satmarav on the spot, like instantly, responded to him, "Vas artir as is a shach. What do you care that it's just a shach and not the Shulchan Aruch himself?" So the guy was taken aback. So he went back and looked through every shach and Hilchas ribis, and he couldn't find it. So he came back a second time to the Satmarav and said, "I couldn't find it in the shach either." So the Shach Marav po- opened up a Shach, and he said at the end of every section of the halachas that the Shach wrote in Shulchan Aruch, he, he, besides for his long, long, brilliant commentary, he also included a short poem at the, every, at the end of every section. And at the end of the section, again, the poetic, the, the, the Shach had that side, Tim Nachi mentioned his slichas that he wrote uh, after Tach Vatatz, he had a poetic side to him. So at the end of every section of halachas, he wrote a small, short poem about the halachas that he had just written about. And at the end of the one on Ribis, um, he had this poem in rhyme that said, and it included the line, something about v'chai lo yichye, that he's not going to get up at tchiz amesim. So he hinted here that, that, uh, that he wouldn't have tchiz amesim. So it's an incredible story, both about the shach, about what he was capable of, not just writing a pirish on on halacha, but also writing these poems and hinting in these rhymed lines of the poems further halachas that you would never have guessed. And then the incredible wisdom, the Torah scholarship of the Satmarov, that instantly he was able to know not just what the shach says, but even what he says in his little poems at the end of every halacha. Um, that was the shach. Now, we came to Prague. Um, and um, the Prague is, is of course, the Alt Naishul, and the Maral, and the Kliakar, and the Naidib Yehuda, which was a major highlight, especially in the context of Rup Surly Bornstein's Daf Mishir. It's a favorite, um, uh, someone who's cited one of the most there. Um, but Davi and I's favorite, and this is something Davi was able to share with the whole group, was that it's also the place of the, Ma- of the Gailam. Um, and uh, something that I mentioned at the, before we get to what Davi spoke about, about the Gailam, it's something that I mentioned at the entrance to the cemetery is that the Maral, through his Sfarim that Nachi mentioned before, is taking us as Gailams and making us into wise people. The Maral gave us these incredible Sfarim, this incredible tire of the Maral. And if we engage in the leg- Torah legacy of the Maral, then we as Gailams can actually become Chachamim, we can become wise people. So why don't we focus on that aspect of the Maharal, of, make, of him turning us uh, into, you know, away from being Gailams into wise people, instead of focusing on the supposed Gailam that the Maharal 
uh, made. So what did you what did you speak about, David? Well, first, first of all, if you would have asked my rebbeim growing up if I had a better shot at becoming a golem or getting getting a chance to speak from the pulpit at the Alton show, I think they would have gone with being a golem, right? <laughs> so so I have to say. Kudos to Eli Slamowitz, who was able to uh, rent out the Alton Eichel for a couple of hours. And uh, I had a chance to, uh, to speak for a few minutes, and, 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 we, and Yehud just spoke a little bit. Um, and, and we spoke about the, the history of the Alton Eichel, and of course, you know, like America runs on Duncan, Prague runs on the Goyalm. Everything is the Goyalm. Everywhere you go, they're selling these little, these little menchies, uh, you know, that look like the Goyalm, and there's Goyalm Restaurant and Goyalm This. And go on that, and there's a big avoid Zara somewhere of the guy on and, and literally, it's like the most exciting thing going in in Prague, especially when hockey season is is not is, is inactive. But um, so so we had a chance to speak about about the guy on and, and of course, you know, lots of people asking, is it true? Is it not true? And and someone said, you know, there's no way you could prove that someone didn't have a guy on, right? You can only prove that someone had a guy on. But um, I think that that we're able to to, to go through the story and the way, when we look at all of the the details um, and we dig deep, we can see that it's 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 pretty hard to fathom that the morale had a garlam. Um and I think that we once we, we did actually write a for the record column um, with a with an article that we found. Going back to 1861, I'll read it quickly. It says, Prague. Some young men, again, had the courage to break into the garret of that remarkable old synagogue called the Altenor Shul. The first time we were among them and found many things remarkable to the antiquarian, such as a bill of divorce dated in the year 1407, a scroll containing the sections of the prophets as read in the synagogues, supposedly hailing from the 13th century, and which is the most remarkable among the fragments, a musical percussion instrument. There was also found a collection of psalms with peculiar signs over the words supposed to have served as musical characters. The golem was not found again. I'm not sure how much of this is satire at the end, but, but it seems like this was a regular occurrence where... You already get to the mid late eighteen hundreds. The rumors of the Maral's Golem, um, based on a probably the first book that appears, and these are really um, the first uh, the first we hear of the Golem, right? Is, is around is around then, um, and 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 if you go back to the time of the Maral, and you're not talking about, I mean. What year did the Maral die? 1609. 1609, right? So, so we're talking about a time we have recorded a spade from, say, David Gans, right? Who was a historian. And a close Talmud of the Maral. Close Talmud of the Maral, who would have enjoyed nothing more than to write about this incredible phenomenon that was, that, that was the Gilem, right? And, and it's nothing, right? There's other spade of Talmudim. Nobody writes about it. You have the Chida, Shem Agdailam, right, who talks about everything that he saw in Europe and the people he met and definitely talks about things that he heard about. And, and the Chida would have been fascinated, right, by the story of, of Gailam. And the Chida, probably, of people in that era, was somebody that would have known how to create a, a Gailam, right? And he also writes about all the quote-unquote Gailam-type people that he meets. But that's, <laughs> that's part of what's, what makes his memoirs, his travel diaries, so interesting. By the way, I mean, Nachi seems to every week tell me about a new version, right? Three new ones. Three new ones that come out. So I think there's either, maybe there's like a competition who could put out the best version. But uh, absolutely, definitely one of the, one of the most fascinating memoirs. Um, ever, you also mentioned in the Adlai Shul that the, the, sec, the general source, the Christian sources don't bring any either. You mentioned no, that. yeah, until until much later on, children's books. But but what's really interesting, obviously, is the research that Professor Schneider Lyman has done, um, and 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 recently, Ira Robinson's book on Rabbi Yil Rosenberg of of Montreal, and his whole story of the uh, of, of the safer that he discovered or or supposedly discovered in the 
Royal Library of Metz, right? Which had all kinds of stories, fascinating stories about the Golem. But we later find out there's a small problem is that, first of all, there was no Royal Library in Metz. It's probably a library in Metz. But he, he, he claims that he found a manuscript written by the Maral son-in-law, which had all these incredible stories. But, but when examined closely, you see that there's some problems in that, number one, the Maral's son-in-law refers to himself as Zatzal, Right. Usually, authors don't write articles or write, write books when there's that sal, and he also makes mistakes with regards to the Morales family. So it's clear that the person who wrote this was not the Morales son-in-law. Um, and later on, which is interesting, is that is what Schneider Lyman uncovered is that when Yul Rosenberg classifies his, he, he, I think he wrote, the, he wrote one of the first translations of Desire, Yul Rosenberg, Yul Rosenberg put out many, many different svarim, And he classifies them in different categories. And uh, one of them is folklore. And he, he puts the morale, he puts the, puts, the morale, puts the morale in, that, in, that, in that category. So, so, Probably either he realizes that you know he made a mistake and he shouldn't have put this out, and now he's admitting it, right? Or he always knew, and and you know he needed to make a parnasa, so he he put that out. But but the rias, the proofs, you like that? Actually, you should enjoy that, right? The proofs that that the, that the the gylem ever existed, they're, they're not really there. Um, there, there are a couple of other, um, there are a couple of other interesting anecdotes to mention. The, the stipler does mention, like I think he says the Bavusta Golem, or um, I don't remember the exact terms, um, but but it seems to be that that it was that when he when asked about it, he said he's saying the Golem, like that that people talk about, not like the he's not saying that there was a Golem. He's saying that people talk about the morale having a Golem. I don't believe that the stipler ever said that he believes that the morale created uh, a golem, right? But we Quite frankly, know. I don't think the stipler researched it either. He had better things to do. Right, right, that's true. But but we do, right, we have, um, we have the... Uh, yes, I, I was going to add, the Chacham Tzvi, in Chuvan's, in uh, Simon Sadi Gimel, has a shaila of a goylem could be mitzar of the minion can account for one of the ten of a minion, and he says like the goylem that his grandfather Blio Bal Shem who was the Blio of Chel made a goylem. So first of all, that's a mention of a goylem, and he says in the Yaakov Emden talks about Megillah Sefer, but the Lechacham Tzvi and make no mention of the Morales goylem. That's the one they're mentioning, not a Morales goylem. Maybe it got conflated, confused. I don't know. I remember hearing of Aaron Lapiansky Shlita uh, talk about that tshuva. And he says that somebody once asked uh, a rabbi about that, right? About whether a goyim can be sire for a minion. And, and the rabbi said, I have an entire shul of goyims. He says, so it was a pashtas, right? They, they can be. Um, but but um, there, there are. There's, there, and, and then lastly, there's the, the, the uh, story of the rayats, the, the river rayats um, of Chabad, who the Friedrich Rebbe, who has, as, a, as a child goes with his father, the Rebbe Roshab, and they go visit um, Prague. And I guess because of who he was, they're willing to bring him up to the attic. By the way, we were not able to get... We were able to get to the show for two hours, but we were not able to get to get into the attic. Uh, I don't think anyone's able to get into the attic anymore. And that's the first question everyone asks about that attic. Um, but, but he describes there um, the the... The Rayatz's daughter, Rabbi Sintchana, said as follows, I then asked my father to tell me what he'd seen there. My father paused for, for a moment and said, When I came up there, the room was filled with dust and shamus. In the center of the room, I could see the form of a man wrapped up and covered. The body was lying on its side. I was very frightened by the sight. I looked around at some of the shamus that were there and left frightened by what I'd seen. So, so what did the, the Friedrich Rebbe see? Who are we to say what is Adik like that, what he saw, right? But he was a child, um, and, you know, I don't know what they told him, I don't know what he saw, but uh, probably that's the closest we have to, to uh, anyone saying, you know, there, is, there was uh, Marcus Hirsch, 
um, who, who, like, early in the 20th century says he heard from a former shamus, he heard from his predecessor that they were the ones that bury the remains um, of what was left of the Gailam in together with the Geniza that was in the attic, right, in the, in the cemetery um, in, in Prague. But, but there, really, there really isn't much else in terms of proof. But that hasn't stopped the city of Prague from capitalizing big time on, on this <laughs> myth um, and, and making a lot of money. So, listen, can we say whether the morale had a golem or not definitively? No. You know, we, we're going to leave it up to, to you to make the decision, you the listener. Um, but, uh, but, but to me, it's, it's pretty hard to imagine. And, and, and to most, almost all the major scholars out there, as many... You know, Gedali Yisrael, you know, they don't seem to take the whole story too seriously. I would add two more things to the, just to, to wrap it up. Number one, in, 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 uh, in history research, we learn a, a basic idea that if something should have left a trail of sources and doesn't, then that's the greatest source imaginable that that, that occurrence didn't take place. Not everything should have left a, a, a source behind. Some things are insignificant. If someone in some random little shtetl um, threw an apple across the road, then I wouldn't expect that to be recorded anywhere. But Prague was the capital of the, of the empire at the time. Um, the Maral was the most famous rabbi in the world at the time. He had hundreds of Talmidim. There would be church records, political records, rabbinical records, farim. Something should have been left in the record. Well, he was close with the royalty, right? He, and, he and, had an audience with Emperor Rudolf, and, and there would have. There's no doubt that when, they, yeah. when there were reports of that, right, there would have been said that this is the guy who created the Gaelum, right? Right, and they probably would have locked him up for that too, <laughs> or they would have asked him to create all Gaelums for for their army, and, and we could stop with the Gaelum jokes. But you know, let's be honest, he may have had an army of Gaelums, <laughs> but but. It, it, it's just really hard to imagine. Far so, so there are those who do say that that part of the whole deal with Talmudim was so the Gaelim was that they were sworn to secrecy for life. It's speculative. The the last thing I want to say is is that I know we have a lot of Chabad listeners out there, and I don't want you to take us the wrong way, uh, because I've had you know some some disputes and and uh, you know some some hate mail as well in the past. This is in no way means to disrespect anyone who claims that there was a Gailam. And it's a legitimate opinion, and if the Friedrich Rebbe says he saw it, then I believe him that he saw it. I'm not sure what exactly he saw, and I don't know what details that tells us about what the Maral used with this Gailam, but, you know, that's fine, and that's a very legitimate source, and that's great to believe it. And if your Rebbe said it and you believe in the Rebbe, go for it, and no, no one's telling you not to, and, uh, and we're presenting all the different uh, versions here and all the different sources here, and along with our own skepticism, which I think we're allowed to have as well. And what I would add to this is what you would have said in the beginning of this conversation of the Gaelam, which is what I heard in Yeshiva, kind of what you said, Yehuda, which is it's irrelevant, really, if the morale made a Gaelam. What is important is that the morale wrote Gurari, and the morale wrote his other Svarim. And the morale was the morale. And the Gaelum part is irrelevant. It's, irre- it's relevant for the city of Prague and their tourism <laughs> industry, but it's not really relevant uh, for us. And I'll, and I'll add also something about Trevito Rosenberg that I actually have somewhat a cousin who's a descendant, so, but about him, that he was a Tamil Chacham. Um, he actually wrote, say, for Yadis in the Dharam on a Dharam that's used in other spots. Was he the Baal Shem, by the way? I don't know. But, don't know. He, he, but he, I will say, we know he forged. Definitely the morale's Haggadah that he found in this royal library, that, there, that is not true. The morale wrote Gvurus Hashem that has parts in Haggadah Shal Pesach, and it's been now created into Haggadah. But what he did, there was no Haggadah either. So we know there's definitely a lot of questionable stuff. Um, when I had Rabbi Shua Hartman, the foremost expert on morale, you know, you can listen to that podcast episode from a while back on Sparm Chatter. He didn't want to give an answer. He didn't want to say, again, same thing. I don't want to say for sure or not, but, you know, whatever. That's the, the, the same kind of thing. I, I, I want to say, so going back to something else about Prague, and in Prague today, I think that's the Gelem, there's a number of other things that stood out to me, being in that old cemetery, I said that was really awe-inspiring, 
is, uh, first of all, so the cover of David Appenheim, who I've done a podcast episode in the past. I don't know if you have Yehuda, uh, if you have not. Um, he's the you know, major bibliophile chief rabbi of Nicholsburg before he came to Prague. Um, in the early 18th By the century. Way, underrated rabbinate, Nicholsburg, right? Yes. I don't Rabbanim. think most people realize, right? You go through who were a and Maral Nicholsburg. was also a rabbi Maral. there. Who else? Shamshin or Fall Hirsch. Shamshin or Fall Hirsch, was it, right? Isn't that, was he in Frankfurt already when he applied for the for the job as chief rabbi of, yeah. of England? Is it in Frankfurt oh, already? I, or was, I, that, I was he in Nicholsburg then? I don't even remember. Another thing we wrote about a long time ago, we could probably go back and look, I don't remember. <laughs> But but it's fascinating because you think of Nicholsburg as some backwater, but it, but it really is is not right. Rav David Appenheim was there. Rav David Appenheim was was uh, you know I, we walked into the shul today. What, what was that the 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 in the Kloys, in the Klaus shul as they call it now? And the Arnkaidish says you know Katzin or whatever Shmuel Oppenheim in Tuf Nun Vav in in, in uh, 1696, and Rishul Appenheim was fantastically wealthy. He was a court shoe, Rishul David Appenheim's uncle. And Rishul David Appenheim becomes the chief rabbi of Prague. He has a major library, which stays in Hanover because of the censors. It doesn't come here ever. There's a whole long story how it ends up being sold. It ends up in Oxford in the Bodleian Library. You get the MS Up, OPP. And uh, he, he, many Svarim that we have today, they're the original old editions or uh, manuscripts, they're only because of this library that we still have them today, and now it's in Oxford. So besides reading a major Talmud Chacham, Chuvis Nishal David, other things that are recently being published from him, Shem David al Yad David al Megillah Sefer, and Masech Megillah, someone just printed, massive Sefer. So he gets to his kever, another one, the, the Kliyakar, I think we mentioned, and then um, um, Rivka Tiktiner, uh, Menekes Rivka, Yehuda talked about this, Yehuda can talk about her more, he goes to her kever when he comes here, but... She was the uh, the first full sefer by a woman that we know, printed in Prague, sixteen oh nine in Yiddish. She was a sefer. I mentioned this that uh, to people, to people on the on the trip that uh, the the there was a journal Tfuna, so Tfuna that uh, I don't know if it's still around, but it was pretty recent, a couple of years ago. Blue, thick, big volumes that in I think volume one had half of it, and he, they translated it to Hebrew. And volume two was the rest. For those interested, in I'm sure you could find it somewhere. I don't know if it's on some uploaded at the academia or it's on Chachma, and it's probably. On, uh, I don't remember who did the work, but that's a very interesting safer. So she, her cover, she's very good. in Poland? She was from yeah, Tiktin and she moved to Prague. Who was the row of Tiktin, Rome Kamenovich, right? He was the last row of Tiktin. Yeah. Yeah. She, but she gave, she gave, so it says, I think it she... It all goes back to the mirror. We haven't uh, mentioned the mirror once, it's mm-hmm. all bought. You have, have to get it in. If, if Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg is listening, he's probably waiting for that mention of the mirror, so... <laughs> she gave, she gave, so she gave sermons. She spoke to a woman and she published a, a safer. A uh, very interesting uh, person. And then there's a Victor Karad, I think about 1439. There's others, it's just really interesting. Besides, as you said, the second one, you mentioned Sheer. Yeah, he was, listen, Sheer was, uh, like you just said, a complicated person, the son-in-law of the Ksais. Everyone listening, it was a Moscow, but if you read Avni Malum, he's the Magia and Avni Malum, he published Avni Malum. And what's interesting, he was the first major biographer. He wrote many biographies on Rabbeinu Nisim, Rabbeinu Hananel, uh, the Sorry, Aruch, Rabbeinu Rabbe Nassim, Rabbeinu Sajiga, the, the Aruch. Uh, and many others. So, and Erich Milin, he has a safer. He has many works that he printed. And uh, we got to see Rabbi Fleckless and their Shmuel Landau and their Neide Behuda, of course, as you mentioned. Rabbi Chol Backrack is right next to Neide Behuda. He was the grandson of the Chavos who Abbez in here after. And also Rabbi Sal Ronsberg, as Yehuda showed me his kever, sunk in a little small kever behind the Neide Behuda. And he's in every Gemara. I mean, a major figure in Prague at the time. It's really... Guys, this was a lot of fun. You think he's able to get food here at 2.30 in the morning? <laughs> we had a big dinner, but it was a long time ago. I'm kind of hungry. This, is, this was a great trip, uh, rich in history. We hope to have many more trips. Uh, be in touch with me. We're going to make Nachi into a tour guide, and we're going to bring Dovey yeah, on can more tell you trips, too. This is my appearance on Jewish History Chatter, I guess that's what we're calling it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get invited back. But... but um, I think these trips are amazing. And I think that, you know, I did it with my shul last year together with Yehuda. And I think many of the guys said it was life-changing for them. It really was. Um, and, and I encourage everyone, you know, it, it, can, be co- it can be costly. You know, there are ways to do it economically. Um, you can backpack through Europe, as I once did. I didn't really go with the backpack. I did the Jewish way with a couple of suitcases. But but um, but go and see these sites and, and really learn about them along the way. And there's just something in Achim for the first time. There's just something about about being there, right? Right. Uh, we were talking earlier about Mike and the Mad Dog, right? Mike Frances always says about being in the building, right? When you're in the building, there's just something about that about being in the building, being there, right, in the place where it happened. 
and it just takes it takes your knowledge and your interest right to a whole new level when you can actually see and, and in Europe we have that we have these you know a lot of them are reconstructed but you walk these streets and you see these buildings and we actually tried walking into the uh, to the Prague Opera today and we got one of those you know I'm not sure if it's union run at this point or what <laughs> but but the guy basically told us to get a vec. So so we left, even though we said that there was there was something going on there. We just wanted to see the building, and the guy threw us out. But 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 an opulent, you know, beautiful building, right? And and it's just you know it, it's coming. From people you know who grow up and wherever you grow up, whether it's in New York or in Melbourne, Australia, or whether it's even in London. You know, London isn't quite the same as these uh, cities. So 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 come out here and check it out because it'll really. It'll manage to change your life. And I want to say that Yehuda is an excellent tour guide. I've heard Jewish history sound bites, but I haven't been on a tour with him. And it's not the same. I know listeners to the podcast, he's a great podcast host. But Does he still have a podcast? <laughs> ah, well, well this, is, this is an episode. Here we go. But really, I was super impressed. And, and I have to say, Dovey's right. Being somewhere I was never here before is something that... Uh, people should do you. We should, you know, we should go to Italy or whatever, make another tour. But it's just you walk in the places that the Gedolim were. You're going in their shul where they gave the drush. You know, today, Rabbi really want. Uh, I think he said over parts of today was the day. Today, the day we're recording this. Earlier today was the day that Rosa Fleckers gave a hespit for the night of Yehuda uh, in the Klaus shul. And so he was able to say over parts of that hespid. And, and actually, yeah, he said it was 230 years 200, to the day to, that he delivered this hespid. To the day, and it was the Siyam on Masech Saita, and truly between the last two lines, he said this by the Siyam, and I, I jumped out of my chair, I told Shuli, which it says, Memtes on the base, and part of the hespid of Saita, Memtes on the base, Rabbi Lazar Flaklis is talking about it. It's an Eilish Chodesh Shlishi, I believe. Mili de Mariri. I think, I think that's where it is. I believe that's where it is. Which has been redone, by the way. His, his, the most of his farm. I think you have to add the... If you live under a rock, and you haven't heard of Sroli's uh, Share Liquid, Daf Yami, you should add the links um, for those who want to listen. Even if you, even if you don't follow Daf Yami, he has these raid bites, which are these little little nuggets of information of you know some that, that are sometimes closely related, sometimes loosely related to the Daf. Today he spoke about the famous Cleves get, um, and, and trust me, you'll really enjoy listening to, to him. His passion alone makes it worth listening to, and um, certainly more than listening to me, and, and you know, but I'm glad you guys had me on. And, yeah. uh, Thank you. Thank you, Davi, for coming on. Thank you, Nachi. Um, this was a lot of fun, and um, it was great having Nachi on the trip. It added a lot. And, uh, By the way, hope... I convinced him last minute, like literally. Dovey and Shirley, call me up Thursday afternoon, <laughs> Nachi, finishing my law school we, exams. We need you. We need you to come. Uh-huh. And Nachi really added a lot. People were walking around the cemeteries, and Nachi is just like spitting out information. There, like, yeah, it's like an encyclopedia. Right. So I knew nothing, of course. No, Dovey knew people. plenty. Dovey yeah, added a lot as well. And we'll just... But if we do this again, we could do like Volajin and Mir and things that I know. Jenny right, Miller, right. We'll speak about Jenny Miller and Volajin and... Blake Malin. And on, the when, Chafetz Chaim. Why is we'll it going to Philadelphia? Let's go. <laughs> Maybe we get people signed up for that. I know it's not the same. I know, I'm kidding. But anyways, but this is amazing for me to come on. And uh, thank you to Ali Islam with ENS Tours and Shirley Bornstein and everybody. It was a really <laughs> fantastic trip. And uh, thank you for listening to the episode. This was Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can uh, be in touch with me at Yehuda at YehudaGeber.com for questions, comments, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures. And subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on your favorite podcast platform. And here's Nachi. Yes, with Sfarim Chatter, the Sfarim Chatter podcast, so you can be in touch with me. Also, sponsors, I don't know about tours, but maybe Yehuda wants to do it. But anyways, you can email me, Nachi at SfarimChatter.com or SfarimChatter at gmail.com. And also subscribe and check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can email these guys and, and they'll filter it for me. But, you know, if it's something nice, I'll, they'll, they'll follow Unless it's on. about Jenny Miller, not about Philadelphia. Jenny Miller. Then you can send the email. Let's go.